Hey, welcome back. So in this video, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time looking at the fourth programming language. Now, if you've never heard of fourth before, you'd be forgiven because it's like a language that's 50 years old and is very, very rarely used these days. But actually, it plays a super important part because fourth is the language that powers Bitcoin. And that's kind of how I spent time looking at it because I was getting under the hood of Bitcoin. And, you know, in my obsession of looking for Satoshi Nakamoto, I wanted to understand the code a lot more and how it was built. And by spending time looking at the Bitcoin code, I sort of realized that Bitcoin itself and smart contracts is largely about fourth. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't care about fourth, I don't really need to understand how that works. Well, actually, fourth is a really nice abstraction over the top of stack machines. And we've spent a lot of time in these videos talking about stack machines and assembly programming, you know, both from my videos on WebAssembly, which is a stack machine, and the videos that we've done on Rust. So actually, if you want to understand stacks and you want to understand stack machines, and even have just one level above assembly, Forth is a really good language for doing that. So anyway, in this video, we're going to spend a bunch of time looking at Forth, showing you how to get started, what the language is like, so you get familiar with it pretty quickly. But we will then also take a deep dive into the Bitcoin code and have a look at how it compares. And you will be able to see the influence on Forth. And that's one of the things that I'm sort of saying here, that for those people who are interested on who Satoshi Nakamoto is, a lot of people focus on the cryptography side of things, but actually I think this fourth programming piece is even more important. So anyway, hope you're gonna have fun in this video as much as I've had creating it, and uh, let's get started. All right, first things first, to get started with fourth, we need to have a fourth interpreter installed on our machine. I'm gonna use a tool called GeForce. It's available pretty much for all machines. I'm on my Mac, so to get that installed, I would just type in brew install at GeForce. Uh, and then once that's installed, it's pretty easy to get started with. Uh, if you're not running a Mac, then you can obviously uh, just Google for it and then download GeForce. It's available on Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, whatever. So as you can see, GeForce is already on my machine. Uh, and to get started with it, all I need to do is type in GeForce. And there you see it's got a nice little command line prompt there and I can start interact with it. If I want to exit, I can just type by, as you can see, and then it's gone. And then if I want to enter back into the GeForce interpreter, I just type in GeForce and then I'm back in. So as I said before, Forth is a stack-based language. So I just think of that as a stack of paper. So if I want to put something on a stack, I'm just putting it on the top. So let's say I was going to sort of put numbers on a stack. I could put the number here. And then if I want to put another number on a stack, I would, it would become the top. And then the number and the other. So it's just like a uh, stack of papers. And then if I want to take something off the stack, I'm just going to pop it. So I push onto the stack and then I pop off of the stack. So if that's not super clear, let me show you what that means in Forth. So if I want to pop something onto the stack. Let's say I'm going to pop the number 10 on there. I just uh, type in 10 and then it's on the stack. Now, if I want to see what's on the stack, I can just type in dot s and that will show me everything that's on the stack. So you can see there I have got the number 10 uh, and basically that's the first item at the top of the stack. Now, if I want to uh, pop that off the stack, I can just type in dot and you can see it's came back with 10. So what that's done is it's popped something off the stack and then it's printed it out to the screen. So if I did a dot S again, you can see I've got nothing on the stack. So that is a basic stack operation. So if I got 10 again and then 20, I should have two items on the stack. 10 should be at the bottom, 20 should be at the top. If I look at the stack dot S, you can see 10 and 20. And then it's saying index two is at the top of the stack. So we're kind of good to go there. If I want to start popping things off the stack, so let's say I do a, top, uh, a dot again, you can see it's popped off 20 and displayed it. So now uh, I've displayed the number 20 and then I should only have uh, the number 10 back on the stack. So if I do a dot S again, you can see 10 is left. And then of course, if I do a dot again, 10 is popped off and displayed and you can see <laughs> that the stack should now be empty. So if I just do a dot S again, you can see there's nothing on the stack. And as you can see, that is basic stack operations. I push onto the stack and then I pop off of the stack. And you can see fourth is a really easy language to get started with, right? It's super simple. We're just putting things on and off. Okay, so the next thing to be aware of with fourth as a language is that 
everything is essentially separated by space. So if you think about things like C, where uh, statements are semicolon terminated, with the fourth language, it's actually spaces that are that separation point. Now, you saw in the previous example, I was sort of typing in return, but that's essentially treated like a space as well. So it's a kind of non-visible character type thing. So I can write things a lot more succinctly than I did before. So if I want to start pushing and popping things uh, on, on and off the stack, then I can do that as a separation with the space. So let me show you what I mean. So if I want to stick maybe 10, 20, and 30 onto the stack, I can just do 10, 20, 30, right? Before I was doing a uh, character turn, but now I can just do that. And then if I wanted to display it, I could do a dot S there. So you can see there, it comes back with 10, 20, 30, okay. If I wanna pop and display <laughs> all three items in a row, I could go dot, dot, dot. And then you can see it's gonna go 30, 20, 10, and then okay. So that everything is essentially separated by a space in fourth. Okay, so as useful as all that is, um, I suppose you want to get down to actually doing some stuff rather than just kind of pushing and popping things on and off the stack. What you really want to be able to do is actually start doing some regular kind of coding type stuff. So uh, in this case, it is a stack. So let's do some basic calculations. We'll do some additions, some multiplications, etc. So let's let's do this. So in the case of uh, fourth, it actually uses a concept called postfix. Addition. Now, if you've watched any of my WebAssembly videos, you'll know exactly what that means, which is essentially I'm going to uh, push things onto the stack, and then at the end, I'm going to say what the operation is. So let me show you what I mean. So if I want to add two numbers together, let's say I want to add 10 to 20, then I would put uh, 10 onto the stack, I put 20 onto the stack, and then I would put the plus. And basically what it's going to then do, the plus is going to pop off the two items and then push on the result of the item. So let's show you what that means. So 10, 20, and then plus. So you can see it's came back with OK. And then if I do a dot S there, you can see I've got one item on the stack. So let me make that a little bit simpler and we'll do it a little bit slower. So to do that same calculation, I'm going to push 10 onto the stack. So the stack should now just have 10 on it, which it does. Remember, I haven't done the dot, I've done a dot S, so I'm looking at things without uh, popping them off. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push 20 onto the stack. So you see it comes back with okay. And then if I look at the stack again, it's 10 and 20. And you can see 20 is at the top of the stack there. Now, if I wanna do an addition, I can just do a plus. So if I hit plus there, what that's gonna do is it's gonna pop off the 20 and then it's gonna pop off the tens because what the plus is doing is popping off the last two items from the stack and it's gonna come back with the result. So 10 and 20 is now off the stack. The stack would be empty. It's gonna do the calculation. So the calculation is the result will be 30 and then it's gonna push the result, which is 30 back onto the stack. So if I do a dot S, you can see the stack has just got one item on it, which is 30. If I wanna pop off and show the result of the calculation, I could just do a dot and you can see it's gonna come back with 30. Now, if I wanna sort of make that a little bit terser, I could go 10, 20 plus uh, dot, and then you can see it's gonna come back with the result. And then if I look at the stack, it's empty again. If I wanna uh, keep it on the stack, I could just go 10, 20 uh, plus, uh, and you can see that's got the result and then you can see it's come back with 30. So that is postfix addition. Now that is exactly how assembly language works. So again, if you check out my videos on WebAssembly or you check out my videos on Rust, you will see that's exactly how calculations happen in those machines, which is you essentially push items onto the stack, you, they get the calculation is done and they, they're popped off the stack and then the result is pushed back on the stack. So it's very close to how assembly language works. Now, obviously I've shown you addition, but the same uh, works for other mathematical operations. So I can do minus and I can do multiplication, I can do division. So uh, let me show you what I mean. So if I wanna do 50 minus 20, for example, I could put 50 on the stack, 20 on the stack, and then I would do minus as my uh, postfix uh, operation. Uh, and then you see it's gonna come back with there. And then if I do that, you can see it comes back with 30. So essentially it's gonna pop off two items off the stack. The first item, yeah, the, the lowest in the stack, i.e. the 50, is gonna be the 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 calculation, the, the top number, and then the last item in the stack is the one that you're gonna minus. And then again, both of those, those items are popped off the stack, and the result, which is 30, is then pushed back onto the stack. Yep, 
Um, so that's one calculation. Let's get rid of that. So we should have a an empty stack now, as you can see. Again, if I want to do multiplication. So if I want to do maybe 10 multiplied by 20, I can put 10, 20, put a multiplication uh, symbol in there, and you can see it's come back with uh, OK. And then if I do that, you can see the result is 200. If I want to maybe divide a number. So if I do 200 divided by 10, so that's 200, 10, then it should come back with the number 20. And as you can see, it came back with 20. So that it's, it's obviously the first number that goes into the stack, i.e. the lowest item in the stack is the one that uh, is going to uh, be the top number. And then the last item in the stack is the one you're dividing by. So as I said before, it only deals with the last two numbers on the stack. So if I put more numbers on the stack, let's put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I put 10 and 5 and then a division. And then what we would be ending up with is on the stack is both the 10 and the 5 will be popped off and then it'll do the division and then it'll put the number 2 back in. So what are at the top of the stack? So what I would expect is that to be coming back with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2. So if I just run that for a second, do a dot S, you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2. So it's always dealing with those last items on this stack. Um, again, other calculations I can do. So in, in that case, it's uh, uh, an integer division. Um, it, that was a sort of clean division. If I put a non-clean division on there, uh, let's say I want to divide um, uh, 20 by 3. So I could just put 20, 3, and then I will uh, do a division, and then just we'll just pop that off and display the character at the same time. You can see it's kind of come back with 6, and that's because it's going to have a remainder of 2. So, you know, 6 multiplied by 3 is 18, the remainder is going to be 2. If I want to get the mod of that, then I can do the same thing. So I can do, uh, rather than having the divide uh, symbol, I could put mod, and then we can uh, pop that off as well and display, and you can see it's two. So as I said before, uh, six multiplied by three is 18. The twos are remainder to get to 20. That's your that's your modules. Again, you can also do max and min. So if I put uh, number 10, number five, and then put max, 10 would be expected to be the max, which it is. And if But if I did the same, and this time I put min, uh, you can see that five is going to be the min. So all of those sort of calculation operations that you would expect uh, uh, to be there are all part of fourth uh, as a language. And again, as you can see, it's super simple. Anybody can pick this up. It's really simple. Okay, so so far we've had a little bit of fun with some arithmetic and some calculations. And we've had a little bit of fun with the stack. Now what I'm going to do is get a little bit deeper with the stack. And I'm going to show you some of those uh, other stack operations you have available to you. So First thing I'm going to show you is the duplicate or dupe uh, operation on uh, fourth. So again, we'll put some items on the stack. So let's put the number one and the number two, and then we'll type in uh, dupe, and then we'll put in dot s. So what does dupe do? Basically, it's going to duplicate the top item on the stack. So if you think about this, the number two is going to be the top item on the stack. Uh, number one is the bottom item on the stack there. So what I would expect from our stack is to have one, two. It's going to duplicate that top item, so it should say two next. So let's do that. And as you can see, it's one, two, two. So that works pretty good. Next item that I want to show, next stack operation, is going to be drop. And what drop does is it's going to drop the top item of the stack. So if I now just type in uh, drop, and then we'll do our dot s again, you can see that two that we duplicated on has disappeared. So I could actually combine them if I want to as well. So what I could do is I could put the number three on the stack, I could put the number four, I could drop, I could then dupe, and then I could put the number two, and then I could dupe that again. So what would actually happen there? I've got one on the stack, I've got two on the stack, I would now have three and four, so that'd be one, two, three, four. It would drop the four, so I'd have one, two, three. It would duplicate the three, so it'd be one, two, three, three. And then it would add two, so it'd be one, two, three, three, two. And then it would dupe, so it'd be one, two, three, three, two, two. Let's see if that's right. Do a dot S, and it is. It's one, two, three, three, two, two. So you can kind of see that that's one of the nice things about fourth is you can just start, you know, combining and mixing and matching. Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, uh, operations on there. So the next thing I'm going to show you is the NIP opcode. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of this for a second, come back into uh, fourth. So 
So if I just put one and two back onto the stack, you can see I've got one and two on the stack at the moment. If I run the drop command, it would get rid of the two because that is the top item of the stack. What the nip command is going to do is it's going to drop the stack minus one. So it's going to get rid of that one. Or So in a case where I have a stack with just two items, it's going to drop the first item on the stack, i.e. the bottom of the stack. So if I just run nip and then I do a dot s there, you can see that I'm left with the number two. It's got rid of that first item, the number one. Now to my point, and then if I, and again, I could uh, drop this one as one. Well. So now I'm back to kind of running with an empty stack. If I have a larger stack, let's say I've got one, two, three, four. Let's look at that. You can see one, two, three, four. Four is at the top of the stack. If I were to run the nip command, it's not gonna drop the, the one, it's going to drop the three because that's the second item of the stack there. So if I just run nip, I should be left with one, two, four. So we just look at that. And as you can see, one, two, four. If I run the nip command again there, it's going to get rid of the two and we're going to be left with four. And then you can see there one and four. If I run the nip command again, it's going to get rid of the one and I'm left with the four. And then I can just drop at the four and I'm like back to having an empty stack. So that is the nip command. So, so far we've done dupe, we've done drop, we've done nip. Um, next ones we're gonna, <laughs> gonna look at is we will have a look at the swap command. Now swap is fairly obvious. So if I do one and a two, and then I run a swap, you can imagine what's gonna happen. It's gonna swap the two around with the one. So if I do that, a dot S there, you can see the one and the two becomes a two and a one. And then if I run the swap command again, you can see it's back to one and two. So I could go <laughs> swap, swap, <laughs> swap, and you <laughs> you will see it will be back to two at one. But it's 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 a bit of a silly command because I've swapped it kind of three times. So if I do a swap again, and then I'm back to one and two. So that's the swap command. It just swaps two numbers around. Now, of course, if the stack is bigger, so let's say I've got, um, I've got one and two on the stack at the moment. So if I add three and four, I've now got a stack of one, two, three, four. If I run the swap command, it's gonna swap the four and a three around. And that will mean I'll have one, two, four, three. Let's do that. And you can see I now have one, two, four, three. And again, if I swap the command again, it's gonna be back to one, two, three, four. So that is the swap command. So let me, uh, let me do a swap again. So it's back to one, two, three, four. And then I'm gonna drop the uh, four for just now, and that's gonna leave us with uh, one, two, three. So the next operation that we're gonna talk about is the rotate operand, or ROT, R-O-T. Now what that does is it's actually gonna deal with three items on the stack. So you see I've got one, two, and three here. And essentially what it's gonna do is take that third item, i.e. the bottom of the stack, or the third item on the stack, and it's gonna move that to the top of the stack. So essentially what will happen is that one is gonna to move to over here. So it will be, rather than it being one, two, three, it will become two, three, one, because the, the, the one, the third item in the stack is gonna become the top of the stack, and then the other two items in the stack is essentially gonna move down. So we should end up with two, three, one. So if I run rot, and then do a dot S, you can see it becomes two, three, one. Now, if I run <laughs> rot again, then that is gonna do the same thing. That two is gonna come at back. So let's run that again. And you see it becomes three, one, two. And then if I run rot it one more time, then that three is gonna to move to the uh, top of the stack and everything else is gonna come down the way and it's back to one, two, three. And that's why it's a, a rotate, right? Because I'm rotating these numbers across uh, the three numbers. Now, of course, if I have a bigger stack again, so let's add four, five, and six, uh, do a dot S, you can see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. But if I do a rot, um, then it's only gonna affect the four, five, and the six. So it's gonna be one, two, three, five, six, four which it is, yeah? And if I run rot again, it's gonna be one, two, three, six, four, five. So let's do that again, one, two, three, six, four, five. And then if I run rot one more time, you're gonna see it's back to one, two, three, four, five, six. And then finally, the last command that I'm gonna show you is the over command. Now, if you remember the dupe command, the dupe command 
actually copied the last item onto the end of the stack. So if I just run that again, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six on my stack at the moment. If I was to run the dupe command, uh, you're going to see it's going to become one, two, three, four, five, six, six. So we'll just run that again, and you see it becomes that one, two, three, four, five, six, six. We'll just pop and display that last, uh, you know, that last character. You see it's come back with a six, and then I'm back to at one, two, three, four, five, six. What the over command does, and you can probably figure out what's going on here, is it's going to take the second item from the stack there and duplicate that onto the end of the stack. So if I run the over command, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, five. So if we just run that, uh, and that would be over. And then we do a dot s, you can see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, five. So they are our core stack operations. And in fact, if I if I just bring up uh, some slides, everybody loves uh, slides every so often. But if I bring up these slides here, what you can kind of see here, there's a little bit of a notation. And it's basically what they call a sort of stack diagram. Um, so you can see dupe there is we've got this sort of n n minus minus n n. So what that stack diagram format, and the reason I'm showing you that is that if you deal with fourth programming, you're going to see this a lot, is basically the left hand side represents how the stack looks today. And then the right hand side represents how the stack will look post operation. So in the case of duplicate, you start with the stack of n, and then you're going to end up with n n on the stack. In the case of drop, if you start with n one and n two, you're going to be left with n1 because it's going to drop the last item from the stack. If you remember the nip opcode, then you start with n1 and n2. And what it would do is drop the first item on the stack or the, the second item from the top. So that n1 would disappear and it become n2. If you remember the swap command that I just showed you, you had to start with n1 and n2 on the stack. You're going to swap n1 and n2 around, so you're going to be left with n2 and n1. And then if you remember the rock command, the rotate, then n1, n2, n3 would become n2, n3, n1, because you're rotating the, the third item on the stack with the top item. And then finally, the over command is uh, similar to the dupe command, where it's n1 and n2. You would duplicate rather than the last item on the stack. You duplicate the first item, or you know the top of the stack minus one. So that would become n1, n2, n1. So that's a bit of familiarity with stack diagrams. So if you deal with any fourth code or anything like that, and you see that syntax, you're going to understand what it means. Now there are other stack commands like tuck and roll. I'm not going to go into that just now, um, or probably <laughs> ever. Uh, they're not use that often in fourth. But again, feel free to kind of check them out if you want, because they are variations of those core commands that you see. You can achieve a tuck and roll by using a combination of the commands that you saw previously. So last thing I'm going to do before we go and look at the Bitcoin code is uh, we're just going to do a little bit of kind of combination. So you saw earlier that I could actually just start combining commands over and over again. So I'm going to show you how you, you could do that with Enforce as well with the idea of uh, functions. Um, and in Enforce, they're not called functions because everything's a very sort of dictionary based language. It's known as words. You know, so if you think of it as operating as a dictionary, then a function and a word is almost sort of the same thing. So let me let me just clear this out again. We'll uh, open up a new version of kind of at G4 there, and then I'll, I'll bring that to life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new word or function called square. So to do that, I would put in a colon, and then I'll put in a name. So I'm going to call it square, I'll make it capitalize, it seems to be that people capitalize. Um, I don't know why. Um, maybe that's kind of just a historical thing 50 years ago, or whatever. But I will follow that convention. Again, everything's kind of space separated there. So and the square function, what I want to be able to do is take the last item on the stack, and then I want to essentially duplicate it. Uh, and and then do a multiplication. So if you think about it, let's say I want to get the square of 10, that would be a 10. And then I want to multiply it by itself. So that's 10. And then a 10. 
and then do the multiplication so that will become 100 and then return that result. So if you think about that in fourth language, I've got one number, which is 10. To have two numbers, I need to do a duplicate, so that would be become 10 and 10. And then I would do my postfix uh, operation calculation, which is a multiplication. So it would be multiply, and then I'm going to come back with the result. So let's do that. So uh, I will put in dupe, uh, and then I'll do the multiplication. And then we will put a semicolon terminate just to say, hey, I, I have defined this word, this function, uh, and then it's done. So we'll do that. You can see it's came back with an OK. And now I can just execute it like uh, any other sort of command. So I would just do, let's say I want to get the square root of 10. I would just do 10. So I push 10 onto the stack. So let's see that. We've got 10 on the stack. And then I can run square. Uh, and then what it's going to do is it's going to pop off <laughs> Uh, if you think about what it was doing there, I've got a 10. It's going to duplicate the 10, as you would expect. So it would be 10 and 10 on the stack. And then it's going to do the multiplication. So both of those items, both of those 10s would be popped off. The result 100 would be popped onto the stack. And that would be my result. So if I now do a dot S, you can see I've got 100 on the stack. And then if I want to get rid of that, I can just uh, uh, pop that off and display. And I will be back with an empty stack. And again, I can do any sort of calculation. So uh, the square of uh, 3 uh, would be 9. The square of 5 would be uh, 25. So I can essentially do whatever I want. Uh, square of 100 would be 10,000. So you can see you can start to have that sort of function capability. And again, if I want to add something else in there, maybe I want to uh, double it. Double it's kind of like a square, except rather than doing a multiplication, what I'm going to do is an addition. So, you know, <laughs> you think about it, I've got a number 10. I want to double it. Double and it would be 20. So how would I do that? I would take the number, I would duplicate it, and then I would add them together. So let's define that. So, you know, colon to represent that, that I'm creating a new word. Uh, I'm going to call it double. And then I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to add put as my first fix operation. So I'm going to take pop off the two items from the stack because I've got two items on the stack now. I'm going to do the addition and then I'm going to return the result. So semicolon on that. So if I uh, <laughs> so if I do a ten, I would expect a twenty back. So let's do ten double, and you can see uh, I've got a twenty back. And I and I could keep doubling. I could go ten double double double, double, uh, and then we could uh, just display that. And you can see it's come back with 160 because it's just doubling, doubling, doubling. If I want, I could combine that with the square. Um, so I could, um, so what I could do is do a 10, do a square, which would be 100. I could double it. <laughs> I could square it. I could double it and then uh, pop off the result. And you can see that comes back with 80,000. So I can start to combine those functions uh, together. Now, as I said earlier, my obsession with this started when I started looking at the Bitcoin code. Now, I was looking at the original Bitcoin code. Um, actually, it wasn't quite the original. It was version 0 0.5, which is a little bit later on. But I was looking at the real code that Satoshi Nakamoto created. But this code, this Bitcoin code, this Bitcoin script, which is all built on fourth, still exists today in current Bitcoin. So let me let me show you what I mean. And then you're going to look at this and go, oh, my goodness, this is so similar. It's unbelievable. So let's uh, let's open up Brave. So this is the Bitcoin script. This is uh, the smart contracts, essentially. And really underneath the hood here, um, it is a simplified version of fourth. And you can see this here. It says script is a stack machine like fourth. It's not like fourth. It's almost exactly like fourth, except a couple of the commands are removed. It, that evaluates predicate, return a bill valid or not. There are no loops. We'll come into that a little bit later. But let's let's have a look at some of the commands under, underneath this. Okay, so I'm going to start from here. And I want you to see this, right? <laughs> and And... Hopefully, this will start to look familiar here, right? So what's this case? So there's a big, massive case statement on all the op codes. But the first one that you're going to see here is op drop. Well, we recognize that one, don't we? What's drop going to do? It's going to drop the last item from the stack. And you can see the C++ code. If stack size is uh, less than one, throw an error. Otherwise, it's going to call pop stack. 
It's called drop. And look, look here, x minus minus. You recognize that, right? That's essentially a stack diagram. What's the next one? Op dupe. X minus minus x x. So I've got x. I'm going to duplicate the last item on the stack. And you can see it's got some error conditions. And then essentially it's going to push onto the stack. What's the next one? Nip. <laughs> What's the next one? Over. Again, pick and roll, we're not covering in this. And then you can look at, you know, I'm not gonna go into the details of pick and roll, but you can see pick and roll, which are part of fourth language, is already there. What else is there? Rot, rotate, rotate. Swap, yeah, that's there as well. Tuck as well. Size, right, which is essentially, uh, you know, uh, depth there as well. Oh, I never showed you depth, did I? So, I mean, we can come back into this as well. Um, what's on my stack at the moment at zero, so I could go 10, 20, 30, at 40, at 50. And if I if I run the uh, depth uh, command, you can see uh, it's come back with five. So one, two, three, four, five. So depth is uh, supported as well. Um, the next one is, we haven't covered bitwise logic yet. I'll do that in a, a second and, and same with uh, operations, but you can see that that's pretty much gonna be, be the same. We'll, we'll do that in a second, actually. Um, next thing I want you to see is the operations. You can see the additions, you can kind of see the subs, et cetera. You can see there's min and max, et cetera. So all of those are the same sort of things that we covered before. Um, you know, we could we could do an operation <laughs> equal there as well. Um, let, let's let's do um, let's do a, a, an equal. So let's do a comparison. So if I if I do um, ten and tw ten, and then do equals because it's not a double equals like you would have in a kind of C sharp or C plus plus or JavaScript or whatever. It's just an equals. So ten and ten, and it's going to come back with um, minus one. So minus one equal means it's equal to. So it's not like a kind of JavaScript or a C where it's a positive number is, is equals. It's, you know, it's, it's minus one in that particular case. So if I do 10 and 20 and equals, you're gonna see that's gonna come back with uh, a zero. Uh, so zero in that case is, is false. So minus one is true, uh, zero is false. And that's just a kind of comparison. So that's kind of <laughs> there and you can kind of see op equal, et cetera you know, in, in the Bitcoin code. There's a few other things as well, actually. Um, so if I if I scroll up a little bit as well, you can start to see other things like op to drop and op to dupe. Well, actually, and you can you can kind of guess what that is, right? So if you look at uh, uh, to drop there, you can see it's got x1, x2, minus, minus, and then you've got nothing left, right? So you can kind of guess what that's gonna be doing there. It's just gonna be dropping both items. Um, so again, we we could do that. So what's on my stack at the moment? I got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So if I just do two drop, that 40, 50 is gonna go, and then I'm gonna be left with 10, 20, 30. So let's just see that. And you can see I've now got a stack of three items, which is 10, 20, 30. And then you can see two dupe as well. And it's basically gonna duplicate. So in this case, it's got X1, X2, X1, X2, X1, X2. So it's just duplicating two items. So if I've got 10, 20, 30, that's, if I do a two dupe, that's gonna be 10, 20, 30, 20, 30. So let's do that, two dupe, uh, dot S, and you can see it's 10, 20, uh, 30, 20, 30. And if I wanna get rid of it again, I can just do a two drop dot S, and you can see I'm back to 10, 20, 30. Bitcoin is fourth. I mean, hope you're getting this, right? And then you can see there's a three dupe as well. There's two over, two rot, two swap. I mean, I could do the same here. So uh, so if I just stick uh, one more item, uh, yeah. So if I just stick one more item on the stack there, we're gonna be with 10, 20, 30, uh, 40. And then if I just do a two swap dot S, and you can see I've now got 30, 40, 10, and 20. So what, what it's doing is rather than swapping uh, you know, two numbers is, is, is going across four. So that 10, 20, uh, 40 is, is, is moved across. So I've now got 30, 40, 10, 20, because it's swapping two numbers rather than, than one. So, I mean, this is just, you get my point. Bitcoin is just fourth, right? But if I come actually back into the uh, original or one of the early versions of Bitcoin. So if we look at Bitcoin version 0.15, um, this is script.cpp, which is written by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. 
here here is the exact same code, right? There's your op. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you can kind of get the point, right? You can see it's it's the same code as we were shown before. There's all the if and else's. I know I haven't covered that yet. But if we if we look there, there's your two drop, there's your two dupes, there's your uh, three dupes, etc. your two overs. Uh, key thing that I want you to see is, I mean, Satoshi Nakamoto was not great at commenting his code. I'm going to be, or, or her code, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, what you can see there is Satoshi made a point of putting the comments and using stack diagram syntax. That this is really an indication to me that Satoshi really comes from a very strong fourth programming background, right? It, there's a strong understanding of stack. Fourth is not a language that you would really be expecting somebody in 2009 to be picking up and implementing as a smart contract, right? I mean, fourth is a beautiful language, as you can see there, but I, I just wouldn't be expecting somebody to be picking up fourth as a language and really be out of nothing. It's, it's, it's you know, they've, they've came from a fourth programming background and then decided that they're going to put this into uh you know in, into bitcoin and you can see that sort of understanding of uh stack diagrams etc and again back in 2009 i mean it's a po popular enough language but it, it's it certainly wasn't a modern language at that point right time had sort of passed it by um but you can you can see it right you can see this this real uh a linkage between the fourth language and Bitcoin, right? I mean, the the smart contracts are are practically fourth, right? There is some differences there in this swap, and you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, tuck, etc. You know, left, right, sizes. I mean, this is you know, you see some of the sort of op ands, xors, etc. Uh, by the way, a lot of that. So you can see things like uh, like things like the xors, etc. If I come to the latest version of the code, um, let's find xor uh, on this one here. You can see that you know things like cat substring left right invert and or xor two mul two div etc left shift left right have all been disabled off codes right and that's because there was some security incident uh, involved in that and you can look into that in your own time so a lot of those original codes that were there as part of the original code base you know got disabled right because they they, they came with sort of security risks um so it's kind of cleaned up there but but even today's code you can you can see this influence that um that uh you know fourth has has got there you know it, bitcoin is really fourth there now they've obviously added in new opcodes there you see things like uh you know you've got you've got opcodes to handle things like sort of uh, hashing of signatures and verifying of signatures etc and that's fine yeah but essentially beyond that is pretty much fourth as a language Okay, so the last thing I wanted to do is remember I said that fourth was really close to assembly. It was like essentially one level above. It's um, so if you want to understand stack machines and assembly, then fourth is a really great language to do that. One of the things that I thought I'd do is pull the source code for a language for a compiler called E fourth. So that's kind of before G fourth. It was created by a guy called Bill Munch. Um, you know, it's, uh, and basically it's a fourth compiler for MS DOS. So this is. Uh, very, very old in that sense. Um, but if you look at the source code there, you can see how simple it is and how close it is to the assembly language. And if you want to understand assembly language a little bit more, you can check out my Rust and, and assembly video that I created. But if you look at this, you can, I mean, here's the drop up uh, code there. So we, we dealt with that earlier, which is the kind of N minus minus. And there you go, you can kind of see there's the BX register uh, doing a pop and then next there, right? And there's the swap, right? Which is BX uh, register, you're gonna pop that off there. You're gonna pop off the AX register. You're gonna do a push, do a push um, back on there and it's swapped around, right? So you can kind of see pop off of BX, pop off of AX, push, uh, you know, uh, onto BX and push on AX. So you can see that it's just swapping the registers around. And then you can see the same thing with the dupe here. So you've got the BX register, you're gonna pop off of that, and then you're gonna push onto BX, and then you're gonna push onto BX again, right? So you're gonna end up with two items uh, onto the stack there. So, I, I mean, this is, this is really kind of cool stuff. So you can see how close it is uh, as a language. Yeah, but what's really nice about this is if you then look at the code further down and you look at things like 2-drop or 2-dupe, remember we saw that uh, earlier, 
uh, two drop, which is uh, sort of uh, drop two items off of the stack. You can see that's implemented actually in, uh, you know, uh, using uh, fourth. So you can see all it's done there is go drop and then drop, right? And of course, that's going to call the assembly that was written for drop earlier. And then uh, two dupes done the same here. What's really cool about two dupe is it's called over twice. So that's why you start to understand the, you know, uh, what's really nice about fourth is is a kind of language that's built upon itself. You have these core functions that are written in assembly, like like you had with drop and, and things like that. But then, uh, as you sort of go further down the language, then it's built up of its own language, which I think is really cool. So anyway, I mean, and again, you can kind of see that in things like uh, remember I was I was saying that we weren't going to look like uh, you know uh, look at things like pick and and tuck and roll and all that sort of thing. And again, you can see that all that they are actually doing there is combination of existing fourth command. So I think it's really cool. Um, anyway, I think that's kind of about it. I'm not going to go into things like conditionals and branches and if statements, etc. I mean, you know, I've given you a flavor of the language. And again, if, if it's something that's interesting you, then go check that out and start building up code. The reason I'm not going to do that is it's probably fourth is interesting as a language to understand the you know, stacks and basics, etc., and then start picking things up. But if you want to start building something complicated, the it's probably not the language to do that, right? It's, it's nice for being close to assembly, but as you write more complicated code, then then you really, there, there's a reason these languages retire, right? And it's no disrespect to the creators, people like Chuck Moore, et cetera. They've done an amazing job, but, you know, we've evolved over time, and you know my theory on languages already, you know, and the ecosystems that are needed and the libraries, et cetera, to succeed. And, and that's what ultimately results in these languages essentially dying, right? Um, but fourth isn't really dead. It's its ecosystem is built in things like Bitcoin now. But um, so I'm not going to go too much into that detail, but but I'm hoping that, that it's giving you a flavor. And, and then if you experiment with uh, fourth yourself, then you may uh, enjoy the language and play more with it, which is cool. Um, and, and learn more stuff. The last thing I guess I'm going to cover really quickly is the other one is loops. Um, you know, Bitcoin doesn't do loops, obviously. Um, we could get into a whole discussion about Turing complete. Maybe I'll do that in, a, in another video. Um, the, the major reason it doesn't do loops is that, you know, you can think about the issues that you would have by implementing loops within uh, within a sort of smart contract type language like Bitcoin, right? Because it's all about, you know, how many operations you allowed and then being able to sort of restrict that so that you're not essentially killing machines. So they wanted to keep the, the language really simple and be able to perform uh, specific things, right? So the transactions you got and not sort of overtake computing. So again, I guess I could do a video on that point. Um, Anyway, I hope you found this useful. Um, again, if you're into Bitcoin, I'm hoping you've learned a little bit more about Bitcoin and Bitcoin script and, and how smart contracts are actually built with, within there. If, if you're into other languages like WebAssembly, whatever, uh, understanding stack machines a bit better is always good, right? Because you're going to face that regardless. Um, but if you're into computing history, hopefully it's kind of useful to you as well. Anyway, I think fourth is a neat language. I've had fun with it, um, you know. Uh, I do like the fact that the other um, blockchain types have moved on to other languages for smart contracts. But of course, the more complicated the language is, uh, the more at risk it is from being able to be hacked, right? So, so part of the simplicity of Bitcoin and the simplicity of the fourth language within Bitcoin actually reduces the stack surface. Whereas if you're opening up like an entire WebAssembly or Rust or something to be able to execute smart contracts in, then, then that security surface area is much larger. So again, that's just something to, to, to kind of be aware of there, but I absolutely understand why they've moved on to kind of more complicated languages for their smart contracts. Anyway, hope this video has been useful and I'll catch you on the next one.